Welcome to week three, micro. So this week we are going to finally hit into some gram negative rods. We're going to first start with the PowerPoint Enterobacteriaceae. This is the largest of our gram neg rod groups. So you're going to have a lot of bacteria in here that you're very familiar with the terms just from hearing and here and there with food poisoning cases, that kind of thing. So basically, in order to be considered part of the Enterobacteriaceae group, you have to meet all five of these characteristics. So they all must be gram-negative rods. They all must be able to ferment glucose. Now, so a lot of people get this messed up and think it's ferment lactose, which is in McConkie agar. It's not. On McConkie agar, you still can have some of these be lactose fermenters and some of these be non-lactose fermenters. That's not the characteristic. In this case, the characteristic is they must all be able to ferment glucose. They are all oxidase negative. Um, oxidase is a test that we always run on all gram neg rods right away when we know we have a gram neg rod. They all are able to reduce nitrates to nitrites and catalase positive. So those are the five characteristics in order to be considered part of the Enterobacteriaceae group. As far as mode of transmission, when you look at the term Enterobacteriaceae, entero means intestines. So a lot of these do inhabit the GI tracts just normally. Um, they can be colonizers, um, but otherwise when they are past and cause disease or infection, whatever you will, a lot of times they're coming through contaminated food or water, or in the case of, say, Yersinia pestis, they're passed by a flea off of an infected animal. So here are some very common Enterobacteriaceae organisms. So these are ones that you'll see every day in the micro lab. Um, you'll definitely see E. coli every single day in the micro lab. You get really good at E. coli. Proteus, Shigella, Salmonella, Citrobacter, Yersinia, Edwardsiella, Seracea, and then there's more. This isn't an exclusive list. Klebsiella would be a common one that's not on here. Um, there's others as well, but these are some very common ones we frequently encounter. So we'll start with our big bad boy, E. coli. He is definitely found in the intestines just normally. So therefore, your stool samples are going to normally have E. coli as part of him, as part of the stool sample. But there are strains of E. coli that are the infection causers. And so if any of these strains were present, then that would be what's causing like their diarrhea, which is what mainly we're dealing with here. Anytime there's like an E. coli kind of infection with one of these strains listed, a lot of times it's diarrhea. Yes, E. coli is the number one cause of UTIs. It's seen in a lot of other stuff as well. But as far as diarrhea goes, it belonged to one of these groupings. So we have the enterotoxigenic strain of E. coli that causes what we call traveler's diarrhea. Um, if you will, that if you've ever heard of like Montezuma's revenge, like when you go to Mexico, you can get Montezuma's revenge from drinking the water. And that's why we always say, don't drink the water. Um, that's traveler's diarrhea. Enteroinvasive E. coli causes a dysentery and or hemorrhagic. That's your big one of the E. coli 0157. So that specific serotype of E. coli has been linked with causing um, bloody stools and then resulting in what we call HUS, hemolytic uremic syndrome. So that is a disease that maybe you learned in hematology. It's a hemolytic process that involves kidney failure. A lot of times children get it from food poisoning cases. They pick up E. coli 0157 from undercooked ground beef or they might pick up Shigella and that would result in their HUS. So that's where E. coli 0157. So anytime that some patient comes in with diarrhea and the doctor wants to look for stool culture, we always screen for E. coli 0157 as a standard part of that process. And then finally, our last strain is enteropathogenic E. coli, which is diarrhea in infants more specifically. There is another one in your book listed, probably enteroaggregative, but I'm not going to worry about that one here today. So these are the four to remember. All right, so here again is that just E. coli 0157H7, the O and the Hs have been part of the serotyping process to, you know, whittle it down to it's this specific serotype that's causing the issue. 
All right, going over to Shigella's. Shigella is a big food poisoning one too. Lots of diarrhea here. You have different groups of Shigella's from A through D. Shigella dysenteriae commonly causes different epidemics. Flexnerii is probably seen most commonly worldwide. And then group D, Shigella sonii, is actually seen mostly in developed countries. So group B, Flexneri, is seen most commonly worldwide. But as far as the United States go as a developed world, it would be Shigella sonii that's more common here. But at any rate, we can do the same thing here. Whenever we get Shigella in the lab, that's one of those things that we do have to send on to the State Department of Health or wherever reference and they need to serotype it. They want to kind of track what serotypes are popping up and all that to know for epidemics and things like that. With that being said in the serotyping process, Shigella does produce a capsule. So you must heat or boil or whatever it before you can actually properly serotype it. So you'll notice that's down here in big bold letters for you. All right, salmonella, again, another big food poisoning one, thus a lot of diarrhea, gastroenteritis. You have salmonella typhimurium, salmonella, uh, salmonella enteritis. Those are probably the more commonly seen ones. You also have something called enteric or typhoid fever, and that's caused by salmonella typhi, typhi for typhoid. So they go together there in the naming. Again, we also send this as soon as we get it in the lab and we have it, we have to send this on to the State Department to get them serotyping so they can track everything. So they'll do all that there. Or your lab might serotype too, but you have to still send this information on. This is trackable here. Other organisms, Yersinia. So we had mentioned Yersinia pestis earlier. That's the one that a lot of times comes from infected rodents. And so if you handle the rodent like prairie dogs, or you have a flea off the rodent that comes along and bites you, it can pass it that way. But yes, Yersinia pestis is the one that was the cause of the plague. There are two actual forms of plague. There's bubonic and pneumonic. So pneumonic would be in the lungs, of course. Bubonic is lymph node based. Um, and still to this day, we see Yersinia pestis, especially in Arizona. There's a lot of prairie dogs around here. And we do see it coming through. Now, of course, the plague you're thinking of, they used to purposely infect bodies and then throw the bodies over into the enemy lines to pass the plague further, you know, that kind of thing. Um, so they use it in different ways and, you know, some bioterrorism kind of stuff there. But there is natural just picking it up from rodents still to this day. The other Yersinia that is listed here is Yersinia enterocolitica. Enterocolitica causes enterocolitis so kind of just like a different form of intestinal diarrhea stuff again i will say i think i might have this on another slide there is a special auger to grow that and that's called the sin auger c-i-n um, i think it's mentioned on another slide so i'm going to hang on to that but write down sin auger for yersinia proteus oh proteus is a very commonly seen organism common cause of utis e coli is still the number one cause of utis but man you will see a lot of proteus with utis there are two main proteus species proteus mirabilis proteus vulgaris um, the way that you can separate between these is a test that we call indole and we'll do this test in lab but indole will be negative for Proteus mirabilis, positive for vulgaris. So just keep that in mind for now. When we get to play with it in lab a little bit, you'll see it in action there. Okay, so those are just some side notes on some diseases. As far as the Enterobacteriaceae grouping of diseases go, I mean, there's a lot of organisms in this group. Just know in general, we, we know there's a lot of food poisoning, diarrhea kind of stuff happening with the E. coli, Shigella, Salmonellas. Um, there's also a lot of UTIs happening here with a bunch of them. They can be seen in wound cultures. Um, they might even pop up in like a pneumonia or a meningitis or definitely septicemias as always. So they definitely are linked with other culture types and infections. But um, overall, the main thing is probably UTIs and stools. So as far as media goes, blood auger for sure. It's supportive. It grows everything. McConkie. McConkie is specifically meant to grow gram-negative rods. And then as far as some more selective media, of course, if you're looking for Salmonella Shigella, the first three here, H-E-X-L-D-N, there's one called Salmonella Shigella auger. 
are perfect to screen for those. You'd probably set those off of a stool culture specimen. Here's that sin auger looked, looking for Yersinia enteroclitica. It actually will have a bullseye appearance when it grows on sin auger. So Yersinia enteroclitica will be a bullseye colony on that auger plate. And then the other part of screening stool cultures is always screening for E. coli O157. And there's actually a special form of McConkie plate called McConkie sorbitol, Mac sorbitol. And that's helpful in separating if it's E. coli 157 from other types of E. coli. So E. coli 0157 does not ferment sorbitol. So it will be clear colonies on that plate. So again, E. coli 0157 will be clear colonies on a max sorbitol plate, whereas the rest of the E. coli will be, like I think it's like a mauve pink color. Um, so that you can see, so if you grow this out of max sorbitol, Basically, you're looking for clear colonies. If you have a clear colony, then you would proceed to work it up to see if it was E. coli 0157. If there are no clear colonies, you're pretty much good. You're, you know that there's not really it present then. So there it's showing E. coli 0157 as a clear colony, just the one there. And there's the mauve pink that the rest of the E. coli take on. Incubation, it's going to be incubated pretty much normally, 35 to 37 degrees Celsius, um, 24 hours minimum growth before we can start playing with it and working with it. Yersinia, if you should suspect Yersinia, it does tend to grow better at room temperature, but again, a lot of times you're not going to know you might have it, so you're just going to be in the incubator anyway. So, But just a note that Yersinia does like to grow better at room temp. Colony appearance. A lot of times gram nig rods in general are larger colonies. They're typically gray um, and they're a little stinkier. <laughs> I will say that they are a little stinkier than the gram paws is. So that's overall the general characteristics. Some extra notes here, Klebsiella and Enterobacter, these are a part of the whole Enterobacter ACA group. They are very mucousy. So they're very, um, like it says here, mucoid due to a polysaccharide capsule that they have but they literally look like snot on a plate. They look wet, they almost look like they're gonna run down, very, very mucousy. E. coli, just because you're gonna see E. coli ton, it is a large gray colony, and it usually will have a beta hemolysis to it. Now, that being said, everything's not picture perfect, of course. There are some strains of E. coli that have no beta hemolysis, which extra lovely, but for this purpose, just remember beta hemolysis is typically the normal characteristic of E. coli. And then Proteus. Proteus is really neat on an auger plate. It actually does what we call a swarming. Um, it has a lot of movement, motility, um, and so it basically kind of takes over the entire plate. It can make it kind of a pain to work with because if there's anything else on that auger plate, you can't see it because Proteus just kind of takes over the whole thing. So um, I think I have a picture here. I'm going to right here. Here is the Proteus picture on the left side. Kind of looks like those ripples in a water. So like if you threw a rock into the water, it looks like it's rippling. That's Proteus where it moves across the plates. Um, oh, over here on the right side, that's Klebsiella. See how mucusy, snotty like it looks? And then here was E. coli. So again, E. coli on blood auger is beta hemolytic. Typically, a McConkie auger, E. coli is a lactose fermenter, so it'll be a pink-purple colony. On EMB auger, we haven't really spoken about EMB auger, but EMB is used for the same purposes as McConkie auger. It, they, it will grow gram nig rods. So when E. coli grows on EMB auger, it gets this really unique green metallic sheen to it. Okay, and then Yersinia pestis, kind of more of a cauliflower appearance after a few days. Yersinia enteroclitica, again, those bullseye colonies on sin auger. And so here's the bullseye colonies for you for sin auger. They're not picture perfect in your head. Um, I hate saying that picture perfect all the time, but you can kind of see the close-up one, how they look like bullseyes. All right, so whenever we get culture samples in, we always gram stain. Once we figure out it's a gram negative rod, the very first test that we run is actually oxidase. It's not listed on here, but oxidase would be the first test. 
And back on the very first slide we went over, it said all of these are oxidase negative. So once we see we have oxidase negative, then we will do some of these tests. Um, a lot of times we run what we call an IMVIC panel. So these are four different tests put together to help really start to tell which one of the Enterobacteriaceae do we have. Do we have E. coli? Do we have Proteus? Do we have Seracea? So this is a panel that's helpful to start to narrow it down. So it's indole, methyl red, folk, proscaur, and citrate. The little I is just there for pronunciation purposes. All right, so here's some common results of different Enterobacteriaceae organisms. I definitely want you guys to memorize this. You for sure should know E. coli, the very first one. Know that it's indole pause, methyl red pause, vogue, proscaur negative, citrate negative. I would for sure remember that. I would also for sure remember the Proteus vulgaris. I would remember the Klebsiella pneumoniae. Those three should be very crucial to remembering at this point. Uh, but in general, do your best at getting these down. Again, micro is unfortunately a memorization kind of thing. All right, there's other things that we can do to work these up that we will perform. We will do some, um, what we call TSI augers. There's other ones called LIA. We're not going to really play with these. Before equip analyzers become huge in the lab, they used to do these all the time in the hospital labs to decide what they had and to identify things. Now, the TSI and LIA augers, you're not going to see them really in the hospital world. They're more just for education purposes, but they still have a great place in getting to know these characteristics and identification and your boards. Your board still can ask you questions on results of TSI and LIA augers. But just know when you go to the hospital world, you're not going to really see these augers. But um, these are basically tubes, glass tubes, in which that we're going to inoculate the bacteria into and then you look for color reaction on if it fermented different sugars and that kind of thing otherwise again every lab is pretty much anal doing analyzers they're putting identification panels that are filled with all these different tests into the analyzer the analyzer reads for the different reactions and then puts that all together to determine the bacteria you can also do a serotype to determine more specifically which bacteria strain. And then the biggest thing that's coming up right now is molecular. Molecular technology is really becoming huge and it makes for a faster, more efficient identification process. So here's a little bit on the LIA auger. If you're curious, it, stand, it stands for lysine iron auger. Um, basically, when you inoculate this, if the bottom or what we call the butt of the auger tube, if the bottom becomes yellow, it means that glucose was fermented. If the bottom becomes purple or alkaline, then it says it produces this enzyme called lysine decarboxylase. So basically, you're looking for yellow and purple reactions of this auger, and they write it in such a way that the first letter stands for the top of the auger. The bottom letter stands for the butt or the bottom of the auger. So if they were to write K over K, which means purple over purple, the whole tube was purple, that means that it had the enzyme lysine decarboxylase, but it did not ferment glucose because there's no yellow for the glucose fermentation. If it was K over A, then yes, it did ferment glucose at the bottom there. One other note, if there's some black precipitate in that tube, it also produces H2S, hydrogen sulfide. All right, on the triple sugar iron TSI auger side, this is the one we'll play with a little bit in lab. This has three different sugars, thus the name triple sugar. It has lactose, sucrose, and glucose. So again, if glucose is fermented, it will turn yellow, just like the other one. If it is all the way yellow through the entire thing that all three sugars got fermented. So when you look at the bottom, if again, only the bottom is yellow, it's only the glucose that got fermented, just like the other one. If the entire tube is yellow, then all three were fermented. If the entire tube stays like a reddish color, the alkaline coloring, then there was a non-fermenter of sugars. Also, can have black precipitate throughout, and that would mean it's an H2S producer. So those are going to have reactions with each of those. Just a note here, here's the um, organisms that are common H2S producers, Salmonella, Proteus, Edwards, Ciella, and Citrobacter. 
I use this knowledge to really help me on questions. So if I get a test question that's saying, oh, you have an A over A reaction with H2S production. Well, I know there's only really four bacteria that produce H2S out of the gram negative rods here that we're talking about. So right away, I go down to my answer choices and I look for these four. If one of these is present and no others, then I know it has to be that one because nothing else. If two of these are present, then it has to be one of those two, and then I go from there. So I look at the H2S or non-H2S production first. So again, if you're given a TSI reaction and there's no H2S production, then you can right away rule these ones out. So I just use that to help me in answering my questions, my test questions. Okay, so that was Enterobacteriaceae. Um, Lots and lots and lots of organisms. I'm sure you're like, well, we didn't even talk about them all. Just remember, in general, they're causing urine tract infections, wound cultures, that kind of thing. We kind of talked about different colony morphology. We pointed out any that were unique. You just have to start to get to know the test results that go with them to how to identify which is which. Couple extra notes that I noticed that weren't in here that I do want to mention. Um, and I'm just going to make this bigger so I can type. Serratia, we had mentioned that as one of the Enterobacteriaceae. This has a unique characteristic in that it is a late lactose fermenter. As a result, it will be a red pigment on the McConkey plate. Usually we talked about McConkey agar having clear or purple colonies. This one's a little unique because it's such a late lactose fermenter, it gets this kind of red pigmentation to it on that agar plate. So just a note there. Again, it didn't say it specifically, but E. coli is the number one cause of UTIs. So we'll just write it out there specifically. And let's see. Oh, my goodness. I will have a couple PowerPoints on TSI LIA, again, that will have some reactions at the end of it for TSI that I'll hand out to you um, next week in lab, or I'll put it up in doc sharing so that you can get that. And I felt like there was one other thing I want to mention, and of course now my mind went blank. Um, oh, let's, I, I honestly can't think of what I was going to tell you guys. I'm so sorry. But what I should mention at this point is a password for you to email to me to show that you've listened to me blabber on for a little minute, and I will count that as your attendance since we have no school on Martin Luther King Day. So your password is going to be candle. So email that to me before Tuesday, let's see, before Tuesday, January 17th. I want the password by Tuesday, January 17th to be able to count you as present for the Monday lecture. So that is your password. I'll keep thinking on what I forgot to mention there. But let's go to the next PowerPoint. And in this case, it's going to be Vibrio, Aeromonas, Plesiomonas, and Campylobacter. So these are also all going to be gram-negative rods. So we're going to start with the Vibrio species. Vibrio is found in water environments, causes a lot of GI-type infections. There's four clinically significant species. We have Vibrio cholera. Right away, you should know what that causes, cholera. Vibrio parahemolyticus, vulnificus. And lastly, Algonolyticus, although that one's not that pathogenic, so we're not going to really worry about that last one. Typically, we do not find Vibrio in the U.S. Um, it's just not something they pick up here. We find especially Vibrio cholera more developing third world type scenarios. So part of this is going to be a key, is going to be patient history. Has that patient recently traveled? If yes, we'll screen for Vibrio then. If no, we're not going to be as worried about it. Maybe it'll be present, but we're not going to look for it right away. All right, so again, all grab neck rods, sometimes they might be a little bit curved. They are right away on the oxidase test. Remember I said the minute that you have a grab neck rod, you always oxidase test it. This case, Vibrio is oxidase positive. So that will separate it out from all the Enterobacteriaceae group of bacteria that we just went through. Um, it does reduce nitrate to nitrite, and then there's a special test called a string test. And basically, there's a stringing reaction that will happen after you place the organism into this sodium desoxycholate solution. 
if you want to see more, you can go to this um, link to kind of see the pictures of it and stuff. It's kind of neat. But just know that Vibrio has a positive string test reaction. All right, most Vibrio except Vibrio cholera are halophilic, meaning they love themselves a little bit of salts. Cholera, not as much. It doesn't need, need it, but yes, the rest of them do want some salts. They will grow on blood agar. They'll grow on chocolate. They also grow on a specific agar just to screen for Vibrio called TCBS. So TCBS is used to screen for Vibrio, and on it, Vibrio cholera will be yellow colonies. The other Vibrios are green. So that will help separate which type that you might have. So Vibrio cholera, again, causes cholera, which is a severe gastroenteritis, lots and lots and lots of diarrhea. It basically causes an extreme watery diarrhea. It's pretty much straight liquid. And they call it rice water stools. And so you have complete water, but these little flecks of mucus that are said to look like rice in their stools. And they're going to do this about 10 to 30 times a day, which is, I mean, my gosh, I don't think they get anything else done. So as a result of so much rice water stool passing, they risk huge dehydration, going into shock. You know, they're in third world countries to begin with. Money isn't really there. Healthcare isn't great. You know, it's significant situations and it becomes quickly an epidemic when they pick up cholera out of contaminated water because that's where it likes to be found is water. So that's cholera. Um, the toxin that causes this extreme liquidy diarrhea is the cholera toxin. It basically causes these cells to leak out all their water and electrolytes. All right, Vibrio parahemolyticus. It also causes a gastroenteritis. Um, again, found in water, especially salt water because it wants that salt. This one can be seen in the U.S. We don't screen for it regularly, but it can be seen here. So it's not as severe, though, of a diarrhea as the cholera was. And then finally, Vibrio vulnificus. Again, water environments. This is a huge cause of fatal septicemia is the big thing that we've linked with this. So it basically can develop very, very quickly into full-blown septicemia and be very deadly to the patient within hours. Um, can also cause a nasty necrotizing fasciitis if it gets into wounds. So it's a, just a nasty organism in general. All right, going on to Aramonas. Aramonas is also going to be water environments, gram neg rod, oxidase positive, string test negative. So that will help separate Aramonas from the Vibrios. So Vibrios were all string test positive. All right, infections gastroenteritis, coming from contaminated water or getting fish or seafood out of that contaminated water that they've been contaminated. Um, otherwise, there are some wound infections and stuff like that. I'm not going to test you very much on this. And plesiomonas, water environments as well, gram neg rods, oxys pause, string test negative. So that string test really helps separate the aromonas, plesiomonas from the vibrio. So the only species we're going to look at is plesiomonas shigalloides. And again, gastroenteritis. You see a theme of diarrhea here, I hope. All right. And finally, Campylobacter and Helicobacter. We're going to continue a little bit on the diarrhea train for a second. So Campylobacter is gram neg rods, curved. They are actually said to look like seagull wings on the gram stain. They, again, are oxidase positive. They are non-fermenters. And the main guy that causes the diarrhea or the gastroenteritis, Campylobacter jejuni at the bottom here, really likes an extra warm temperature to grow. It wants a 42 degrees Celsius temperature to be incubated at. So whenever a patient comes in with a significant diarrhea for a few days, the doctor will order a stool culture. In that stool culture, we will set up the plates like blood agar, McConkie. We're going to look for salmonella. We're going to look for shigella. We're going to look for E. coli 157. We're also going to look for Campylobacter jejuni because it is the number one cause of gastroenteritis. And I think that says it on the next slide. Because we need to look for the Campylobacter jejuni since it's a big cause of diarrhea, we need to make sure we set it up to an extra plate to put into a 42 degree environment. The other plates can all go into the normal incubator, but we need to make sure we set up an extra one into that environment. 
All right, so there it's where it says the most common cause of bacterial diarrhea from Campylobacter jejuni comes a lot from raw chicken. Um, there are other Campylobacters, of course. We have coli for gastroenteritis, fetus, concisus, and curvus, which are more associated with periodontal disease. Helicobacter pylori. I think some of you guys will probably have heard of this, H. pylori. Um, this is a gramnig rod, oxase positive, urea positive. That is a very big characteristic for H. pylori. I would definitely remember that result. Um, but the way that you guys have probably heard of H. pylori is through, this is the cause of your ulcers. Well, I don't know if you have ulcers, but somebody's ulcers or gastritis. Um, so we don't typically just grow this out in an auger plate. We do other testing for ulcers. A lot of times it'll be just blood work. We'll look for antibodies. Um, otherwise, commonly we get sent down biopsy samples from the surge floor and we'll put that biopsy sample into a urea auger because H. pylori is so strongly urea positive. We'll put it into a urea auger, incubate it, and the next day we look for a color reaction. If it's positive, it'll be a very bright pink. So bright pink would be urea positive. This is what we commonly did at my last micro lab. We always threw it in there, incubated it, quick look, oh, bright pink positive. It was so simple. So those are the most common ways that we're looking and screening for H. pylori is through biopsies, blood tests, or there is a um, breath test as well. But that, we're not going to really grow this out on an auger plate. All right, so those are some extra gramnig rods. And then we'll have just one last chapter to finish up our basically our whole lecture on diarrhea, it seems like. Maybe that should have been the password. Okay. So infections of the GI tract. So there's your GI tract in picture form. Here is your normal flora. Lots of Enterobacteriaceae again exist as normal flora in the intestines. And then we have tons of anaerobes, Bacteroides, Clostridium, Peptostreptococcus, Bifidobacterium. All four of those are anaerobes. So they are definitely found down in the intestinal tract as well. And then Crinibacterium. So there's lots of toxins at play here to cause all these different types of diarrheas, enterocolitis, dysentery, whatever it might be. So the enterotoxins basically will go in, alter the intestinal cells to release fluid and electrolytes out. So we saw that with cholera. We talked about that really watered down diarrhea. That one does it extremely well. Shigella will also do this, Shigella dysenteriae. Enterotoxigenic E. coli, that's the traveler diarrhea, Salmonella, Clostridium difficile. We'll talk about that more when we get to the anaerobe chapter. And then Campylobacter jejuni. All of these are capable of producing an enterotoxin to release out all this fluid and electrolytes out of the cells of the intestine. Cytotoxins basically will cause the cells to slough off the surface of the intestine, leaves it unprotected and basically results in a dysentery process for a disease. And so three that are really great at producing cytotoxins, again, is Shigella, Clostridium difficile, and Enterohemorrhagic E. coli 0157. Shigella and Enterohemorrhagic E. coli actually produce a very, pretty much the same toxin, if you will. It's called like a Shiga toxin. So, and that's the cytotoxin that it does. And then neurotoxins, these are a lot of times what results into the food poisoning cases. Again, you can get food poisoning just from ingesting that toxin that's left behind without the bacteria present. Staph aureus is known to do this. Bacillus cereus, this is a grandpa's rod that we'll discuss at the end of the session. And then two, again, anaerobes that we'll get into in the anaerobe chapter, the clostridiums there. Um, Clostridium perfringens, the MC means it's the most common at doing this. There's other ways besides just toxins that they produce that they can cause disease and infection. I always say the two together, um, but basically that they can, you know, do harm, attachment, adhering onto a surface. So you have some bacteria here, you have some parasites and some viruses. You do not need to remember this list. It's just informational. Same with this list. This is again informational on how they can go about this disease causing. All right, let's get into some GI tract diseases. Esophagitis um, is basically inflammation of your esophagus. This is usually due to other things, not bacteria. This is more of a virus like herpes or cytomegalovirus 
or the yeast candida. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. Gastritis, again, your ulcers, H. pylori, we just saw that. Proctitis is inflammation of the rectum. There is never, ever a good reason to have this. It's all STD-based. So you got chlamydia, herpes, syphilis, and gonorrhea. All right, as far as specimen collection and transport, um, you can do a rectal swab. We prefer stool samples. And then they'll go into a, um, a bottle that already has preservative and all that kind of stuff in there. Commonly with the stool culture, they're also always ordering what we call an OMP, OVA and Parasite. So that, again, is a bottle with a preservative. All right, when we get in the lab, we're definitely playing into blood auger. We're going to put another plate into a 42-degree environment for the Campylobacter, so we can screen for that. We're going to plate McConkie, because, my God, these are all gram neg rods. HE or XLD is important if you have stool culture because you're screening for Salmonella shigella as well. And then gram negative broth, that'll just really grow anything good. You could also do a McConkie sorbitol plate here to screen for E. coli 0157. It's just whatever your lab has on hand and prefers to set up. As far as C. difficile goes, Clostridium difficile, some of you probably have heard of C. diff, some of you not. It's something we commonly see in nursing homes, hospitals. Um, it comes about after a huge regimen of antibiotics. This will kind of come up and then cause diarrhea. There is usually kit testing available. It's really quick on a kit. You get an answer right away. You can culture this, grow it out. You can also do blood tests, but usually kit testing is the easiest. So it's just a note on that. All right, so that is the end of the week three lecture. If you guys have any questions, please let me know when we're able to come back together and see each other in lab. Have a fabulous week. Until then, hope you have a great weekend off.